What's going on, everybody? It's July 27th, and this is the Block on 24-7 Sports. I'm your host, Nick Costco, filling in once again for Colin Kennedy. I got my guys Blake Rockemeyer and Carl Reed with me once again today. Before we get going, make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the show and the YouTube channel for 24-7 Sports. Help us keep building the program and, of course, building our new YouTube channel. Gentlemen, we got to start out first with some news from last week. Anaya Smith, wide receiver from Texas A&M, had his suspension lifted. Now, as we detailed last week, he missed SEC media days after he was charged with driving while intoxicated, among other charges. Now, there's no update on the charges, but according to his attorney, Anaya Smith is not going to be suspended by the football program, so he should be able to play all 12 games or more for Texas A&M this coming season. You can read more about that at Gigum 24-7. Of course, our Texas A&M site does a wonderful job on 247sports.com. So let's get into it now with our first topic today. It's college football playoff expansion time, maybe. So a 16-team playoff was proposed, or at least is being talked about, according to our own Brandon Marcello. The college football playoff committee would like a decision made reportedly by May of 2023, as the new media rights deal is going to expire by 2025 with the current four-team playoff. So, gentlemen, as we look ahead to the future with the college football playoff, Carl, I'll come to you first. This one is very, very interesting because the expansion has been – all we've actually been talking about this offseason, whether it's the playoff, whether it's conference expansion as well. But for the playoff, this is a huge jump from four to 16 teams. What say you? I think it's a bad idea. I know that everybody is looking for parity in college football – They say they get tired of the same teams winning over and over again, and they think that a playoff will help with that. People want it to be like March Madness, where a Cinderella team can come in and run the table. But football is not basketball. It's not that kind of sport. All you're going to do is extend the season for a couple more weeks, and it's still going to be Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, Clemson, and a handful of other teams. We have a playoff in the FCS. Guess what? North Dakota State has won seven of the last eight championships. And if you put 64 or 128 teams, they would still win the doggone thing. If you look at the Division II playoffs, the same teams in the last 20 years have consistently competed for the championship. If you look at the Division III playoffs, it's been Mount Union and Wisconsin Whitewater consistently almost in every single championship game. This is not going to bring parity. Some teams have made a decision to compete for championships and some haven't. I think it's a bad idea to expand the playoffs to this magnitude. Yeah, I think 16 teams is too many. I know it's all about the money. You know, the NCAA wants to generate uh, as much revenue as they possibly can for, for these teams and programs. And, and, you know, adding to the playoffs would, would definitely do that. I just I, I'm like Carl. I don't I don't see how you can uh, you add that many teams that are that are really going to affect the outcome. I like eight teams. I think if you added uh, you know doubled it maybe I think it would be a little more fair. I still think you're going to see the same teams competing for a national championship every year. Uh, they're going to have to figure out a way where you don't add games to to what these college football players are already playing. I mean, if you make it to the championship game. Uh, right now you're playing 15 games and so you know you're closing in on an NFL schedule uh, and these guys are college athletes I mean I know a lot of them are getting paid now but to me you're gonna have to pay these players a large sum of money to to just keep adding games to their schedule and I think eventually uh, if they do expand the playoffs and do add games you're gonna have to incentivize these kids to, 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 to play by getting paid and maybe the winner gets a little bit more than the loser and some of the star players get more because these guys that are going to the NFL, whether they win or not, they don't want to put their bodies through extra games where they can get hurt and hurt their chances of getting paid at the next level. It seems like this could be a knee jerk reaction to so many guys sitting out bowl games and the bowl games kind of becoming meaningless and the old guard kind of wants to hold on to that bowl model. But at the same time, bowl games have been losing a significant amount of money because guys haven't played. So if you usher several more teams into the playoffs, you think that it extends it for them. But like Blake said, it's really bad for football from a standpoint. We're going to ask these guys to play extra games 
and we got really upset when the players wanted money and when they wanted NIL. But now we're trying to make sure that we preserve our money also. Yeah, these guys, you know, the, their bodies go through a beating. And so, you know, you're doing this, you're, you got spring practice where you're allowed to practice in pads. At some point, they're going to have to, you know, kind of uh, adopt the NFL's model uh, in the off season with not allowing uh, padded practices if they're going to, if they're going to extend the season, in my opinion. But I think paying these kids to, to play is a great way to incentivize kids to play. And I think, you know, it'd be great for, for the average college football fan to, to watch as many of these games as possible. But I just think the outcome is inevitable with the NIL. It changes things a little bit because you, you technically could buy a national championship if you were fully committed uh, to, to one and one, but so far I haven't seen anybody do that. Uh, there's a lot of schools that I expected to come out and, and really put a huge payroll together and, and buy a team, but it hadn't happened yet, but it probably will happen at some point. And just real quick, guys, on this expanded playoff, because we know what the conferences are doing, such as the Big Ten and the SEC, they are expanding. And, of course, Big Ten just added UC USC and UCLA. Texas and Oklahoma are going over the SEC. Wouldn't something like this, like a 16-team playoff, just incentivize to include more Big Ten and SEC teams? And, and for instance, maybe 10 of the 16 teams are – Big Ten and SEC teams, and then the last six are just left for the scraps, basically, for the last uh, – the remainder of the Power Five, if there even is a Power Five by that point. But for right now, we'll move on, and there are, there are some interesting comments coming out now between Matt Corral and Lane Kiffin. Corral, of course, the former Ole Miss quarterback, was drafted by the Carolina Panthers this offseason. Lane Kiffin, of course, still coaching up at Ole Miss. But Matt Corral said – he took the easy way out by committing to Ole Miss because there wasn't much quarterback competition. So those intriguing comments caught the eye of Lane Kiffin, who was on ESPN's first take this morning. Let's take a listen. Well, first off, I wasn't here when Matt got here. So as far as the competition initially, which he was in, um, I wasn't here. Matt immediately texted me after that to say uh, that's not what he meant by it. Um, you know, and that, you know, he actually was in a competition here. And so, um, He's a rookie in the NFL. He's not going to say everything right. He's not going to throw everything right, especially in his first year. So um, I'm sure he'd take that back. But, you know, we're in the, the time where there's not much going on in the media. And so, like I told him, this will run for 48 hours. Nobody will even remember it. I mean, it could run for 48 hours, but we are certainly going to remember this one. But that, those are some eyebrow-raising comments, considering Matt Corral was a pretty solid quarterback for Ole Miss. But, he did have some competition early on in his career before Lane Kiffin, but Blake, I'll come to you first on this one. These are, again, as I say, eyebrow-raising comments from Matt Corral, but Lane Kiffin, I guess, wasn't too offended by it, according to what he just said right there. What say you? Yeah, I, I think Lane Kiffin realizes that Matt Corral had a great experience at Ole Miss, and uh, Ole Miss developed him to the best of their abilities in Lane Kiffin's offense to, to be an NFL quarterback. I mean, Matt Corral – improved dramatically from 2020 to 2021 uh, uh, cut down on the interceptions that he had in, in 2020. So I think it was just a, a, a more of a, you know, maybe he didn't understand the question, but I, I don't think Matt Corral had any, you know, any, you know, bad intentions on talking about Ole Miss and the competition. I think he really just wants to, to, to show the people in the Carolinas that he's willing to, willing to compete. He's a competitor. He knows it's not going to be easy. And, uh, you know, I think at some point uh, he'll have an opportunity to, to do that there. He probably is right now in the most competitive environment of his life. I think that the comment that he made might have been taken out of context a little bit. But I'll say this. How would he feel today if he had went to Alabama to compete with Tua and Mac Jones and Jalen Hurts? And instead of getting ready for NFL training camp, he was pulling out the footballs and the spray gun to paint the field for JV football and getting ready to teach six classes of history, right? So I think that Ole Miss turned out pretty good for him. He's getting the opportunity to compete in the National Football League, and that beats being the offensive coordinator for a JV high school football team. I can tell you that. I'm sure the comments, of course, were definitely a little misconstrued right there, but it's very interesting to see Lane Kiffin's probably the reason why Matt Corral is in the NFL, as you alluded to there, Carl. So I, I'm very fascinated to see if Matt Corral can even uh, find him, find himself onto the NFL field 
in 2022. Now they have Baker Mayfield in addition to Sam Darnold already. Uh, I, I, I really can't believe this next story, but how about this, fellas? Nick Saban almost retired 10, almost 10 years ago, if you can actually believe this, according to a new book that is out by John Talty. And, of course, he was on the College Football Daily with our own Brandon Marcel. You can check that out as well on wherever you get your podcasts and, of course, on our YouTube channel. But he wrote a book about Nick Saban, and he said he almost retired, Saban, that is, after the famous kick six game in 2013 against Auburn where Chris Davis took back the missed field goal all the way back for a touchdown in the Iron Bowl victory for Auburn nine years ago. Carl, I'll come to you first. I mean, can you actually believe this story? It's not to uh, discredit Talty any in any sort of fashion, but Nick Saban retiring after a rivalry loss to Auburn, especially after what it spearheaded over the next five plus years. Well, I can tell you what, I had made a bet that game that Alabama would win easy. And I ended up having to buy some guys 200 wings and two cases of beer. So I almost retired after that too. I wasn't making much money back then. But what I will say about that time and period, Nick Saban was probably being really frustrated at the way college football was going. He was complaining a lot around then about the no huddle offenses and the way that things were changing in offensive football. And losing is tough on coaches. When you lose a game, especially games of that magnitude, it makes you reevaluate everything. So I'm sure that in the moments after that game, he probably had some thoughts, but obviously he came back and ran the table for quite a bit time after that. Yeah, I'm not really buying it, to be honest with you. I think Nick Saban's a football coach. Uh, He does great in the media, and you see him on ESPN and different shows uh, here and there when when he's not coaching. But I, I think, you know, every single person goes through things in their life where they have changes they have opportunities to do things different uh, Nick Saban I'm sure has had a million opportunities to to do things I know that the Texas job was a was a really popular thing that was talked about and uh, obviously it was a was a big letdown for Texas not getting him but I think Saban's a football coach you know he's the greatest that, that ever played that's what he wants to that that's his legacy and that's what he does and I think when something like that happens you have to kind of question, you know, what's what's going on in your life and, and what the next step is. But ultimately, that's, you know, he decided to come back to Alabama, reevaluated what was going on and dominated. Can you imagine a bunch of oil guys and boosters in Texas trying to tell Nick Saban how to run a football program? Nick Saban is the king of the state of Alabama. He's the most powerful figure. He's more powerful than the governor. Everything that happens in the state of Alabama goes through Nick Saban. And I remember Texas wanted them really bad, but I never could see that happening. Yeah, it was a it was a big, big, big mistake by Texas by not getting that done. And, and the rest is history as he's gone on to to win multiple national championships at Alabama since. Does something like that, fellas, spearhead Nick Saban's efforts to recruit even better than he usually did, to coach better than he usually did? I mean, we've seen him since that 2013 game against Auburn. He's, he's been the best coach in college football, not that, he already, not, not, not that he wasn't already, but the fact that he just seemed to get better after that game. Does something like that spearhead a coach is saying, you know what, I'm going to go back to the drawing board and now adapt to maybe a new wave of college football? Carl, I'll come to you first. Yeah, definitely. It, it motivates you. If you're a winner, he's a winner. He's been the standard of winning in all of college sports, not just football. Nobody has been more consistent than Nick Saban at winning. Nobody has been more adaptable. Nobody has had to replace the type of staff that he's had to replace. Look at how many of his guys have left. Look how many went on to become head coaches. Jimbo has won a national championship. Kirby's won a national championship. It's just consistent turnover, but nothing but greatness has come out of Tuscaloosa, and it's all attributed to him. It's all about evolution. You know, when, when you're winning and doing well, the, the natural instinct is to just keep doing what you're doing and not learn, not grow. Nick Saban ha- has shown that he is, has the ability to learn and grow and evolve better than anybody in college football or anybody in sports for that matter. So I think that's the key to success in life and in football. You've got to continue to evolve and grow and, and master your craft because Things are always changing, and you have to to be able to have that ability to adapt or you're going to be left behind. Nick Saban could have yet another national championship by the end of the 2022 season with this reloaded 
Alabama football team. We move on. Notre Dame tight end Michael Mayer is making headlines now as the best tight end in college football, not named Brock Bowers, but our own Blake Brockmeyer did a little bit of a film breakdown on Michael Mayer. This, is, this looks like a future first-round pick out of Notre Dame. It's certainly a star player for Marcus Freeman's crew here in 2022. Blake, coming to you first, your first impressions about Michael Mayer at the tight end position. Yeah, Michael Mayer is, a, is an old-school throwback player when you watch his film. I watched about four of their games last season, and he rarely, if ever, comes off the field, which was kind of surprising to me. But he's a do-it-all tight end. He can put his hand in the ground. He can come off the ball. He can line up as a receiver. You know, they use him in motion a lot. But he works, he works the middle of the field a lot. He, he understands how to stem defenders to create extra space. He's an excellent blocker, better than I think people realize. And uh, he's got great hands, uh, good speed. He, he can be, you know, beat you in the open field. So I really like his game. I think he's a surefire first rounder. Uh, tight ends last year were not a uh, – there wasn't kind of a guy last year that was kind of a first-round guy. And I think he will be a first-round pick this year. And I really like his game. He's got an old-school mentality and – uh, fits in great with with uh, tight end you at, at, at Notre Dame. You know, tight end is becoming a forgotten position in football. It's almost going the way of the fullback. Most guys are going with H backs and motion guys and splitting guys out. This is a guy he can do some of that too, too. But he can still line up on the end of the line of scrimmage with his hand in the dirt and play like a tight end. Like Blake says, should be the number one tight end in this draft this year. Um, and he's at the top of the list. Might be the number one tight end in the draft class, but any chance he's better than Brock Bowers, uh, Blake? Not in my opinion. I think he's Brock Bowers is a special talent, and uh, I think Mayer's a is is an incredible player. Will be a very good pro, but Brock Bowers has got that that it factor, and if he continues to develop after his first year uh, at Georgia and, and gets better, which you would assume he will. Uh, that you know, he could go down as, as maybe one of the greatest tight ends in the history of, of college football when it's all said and done. You know, Brock Bowers is a generational talent. And like the young guys say, he's one of the top two and he ain't two. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Final story of the day, gentlemen, it comes from yesterday at Big Ten Media Days. This isn't two attack of This is Tawali attack of the younger one who has transferred from Alabama and now enters his third year at Maryland. He's a star quarterback in the Big Ten at least, but he said the expectation for Maryland this year is to win the Big Ten and nothing else. Now, to me, it's fine to have these expectations, but quite a bold statement considering the division they're in at least. Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State, Penn State, just to name a few. Guys, what do we think about this? Carl, tell the attack of low. Is he crazy or is he at least confident in his teammates and maybe winning a Big Ten title in Indianapolis later this year? You know, they say the same thing that makes a man great makes him crazy. You know, so he's in a situation, you put the camera in front of his face. How is the guy supposed to say that he doesn't believe in his team and he's going to win? He's showing confidence throughout his locker room. Uh, they do have to play a team called Ohio State that I think I have something to say about that, though. But I don't have a problem with the comments at all. I don't have a problem with him trying to set an expectation as a leader with the guys that he's in the locker room with. Yeah, I like the fact that the leader of the Maryland football team is is sticking up for for his team and showing the country that he believes in them and that you know nothing less than a Big Ten championship is is going to be un, you know accepted for him. And so, you know, the odds of that happening, in my opinion, are slim to none. But that's what you want your 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 star player and your leader, of your team, saying and that he's got your back and that and that that's the expectations. I mean, I doubt anyone's going to stand up there and say we expect to be fifth place this year but uh maryland's got some talent offensively i really like their wide receiver uh, group they've got a top 10 wide receiver group and uh, they've got a couple offensive linemen that i that i really like including their left tackle so they've got some talent we'll see how their defense does uh but uh winning the big 10 in my opinion is 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 a is a pipe dream you know maryland has got a solid roster like blake said mike Loxley is one of the story recruiters in all of college football. There has been stories of him being so dynamic. They say if you send Mike Loxley on the road with a roll of quarters and a payphone, 
he's going to come back home with all the players. So I'm not surprised to see that Maryland does have some talent there. They have some talent, guys, and obviously some, I don't want to say cockiness, but definitely some confidence from Tagovailoa. But, Carl, I'll come back to you real quick because I'm interested now in what Mike Loxley might think of this. When your quarterback, who is pretty good, and basically only had one bad game last year other than that, he was pretty darn good. But when he says something like this, if you're Loxley, how do you feel about that? You know, Mike Loxley's a big dog. He's a very confident guy himself, and he's a winner. You got to remember that they both just came from the University of Alabama also. Loxley's also been several places, and he's had a lot of success. I, I remember when he was, had, was in major bowl games, when he had Juice Williams at the University of Illinois when he was the OC, one of the last times we can remember Illinois being a winner. So he's been in this position before. I think that he likes the confidence of his quarterback, but make no mistake about it, Loxley's a very confident guy and a good football coach, and he expects to win as well. I'm sure he loves it. I mean, you you want your leader of your team being confident, and and like Carl said, Loxley's a, a been around the block a few times. He knows uh, what it looks like to win. Uh, he's had some comments this off season about his expectations for Maryland going forward. They recruit in a very fertile uh, recruiting grounds in the DMV. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if Maryland pulls off an upset this year, but, uh, but I'm glad I know Loxley's probably excited to hear his quarterback, uh, his expectations for the team this year. Certainly a lot of confidence in Tagovailoa, Loxley, and the Maryland football program, perhaps when the playoff inevitably expands to 16 teams in a few years. Maybe Maryland will actually sneak in there from the Big Ten Super Conference. You never know. That's going to do it for us. Thanks for joining us today on The Block. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to the show and the YouTube channel. Help us keep building up the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. Check out all of our other content as well on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts as well. For Carl Reed and Blake Rockemeyer, I'm Nick Costco saying so long. Once again, you have been watching The Block right here on 24-7 Sports.